Hello everybody, in today's episode on Grainificent, in today's episode I will be talking a little bit about the Kodak Company history, founded by Eastman Kodak, originally called Eastman Kodak Company of course. These types of videos require a lot of research and a lot of preparation and it takes a lot of time to create a video like this, so if you do enjoy it, please remember to hit the like button down below and subscribe to the channel if you like film photography related content. So let's get to it. So the Eastman Kodak Company, referred simply as Kodak, is an American public company that produces various products related to its historical basis in analog photography. The company is headquartered in Rochester, New York, and it is incorporated in New Jersey. It is best known for photographic film products, which it brought to a mass market for the first time. The letter K was a favorite of George Eastman's. He is quoted as saying, it seems a strong, incisive sort of letter. He and his mother, Maria, devised the name Kodak using an anagram set. Eastman said that there were three principal concepts he used in creating the name. It should be short, easy to pronounce, and not resemble any other name or to be associated with anything else. According to a 1920 ad, the name was simply invented, made up from letters of the alphabet to meet our trademark requirements. It was short and euphonious and likely to stick in the public mind. The Kodak name was trademarked by Eastman in 1888. Kodak began as a partnership between George Eastman and Henry A. Strong to develop a film roll camera. Eastman entered a partnership with Henry Strong in 1880 and the Eastman Dry Plate Company was founded on January 1st 1881, with Strong as president and Eastman as treasurer. Initially, the company sold dry plates for cameras, but Eastman's interest turned to replacing glass plate altogether with a new roll film process. On October 1st, 1884, the company was reincorporated as the Eastman Dry Plate and Film Company. In 1885, Eastman patented the first practical film roll holder with William Walker, which would allow dry plate cameras to store multiple exposures in a camera simultaneously. That same year, Eastman patented a form of paper film he called American Film. Eastman would continue experimenting with cameras and hired chemist Henry Reichenbach to improve the film. Those experiments would culminate in an 1889 patent for nitrocellulose film. As the company continued to grow, it was reincorporated several more times. In November 1889, it was renamed the Eastman Company and 10,000 shares of stock were issued for $100 each. $100 in 1889 is an equivalent to today's almost $3,300 per share price. On May 23rd, 1892, after the release of the Kodak camera, another round of capitalization occurred and it was renamed Eastman Kodak. An Eastman Kodak of New Jersey was established in 1901 and existed simultaneously with the Eastman Kodak of New York until 1936. At that time, the New York Corporation was dissolved and its assets were transferred to the New Jersey Corporation. Kodak remains incorporated in New Jersey today, although its headquarters are still in Rochester. Under Eastman's direction, the company became one of the world's largest film and camera manufacturers and also developed a model of welfare capitalism where the company supports its workers with more than just paychecks and a close relationship with the city of Rochester. During the most of the 20th century, Kodak held a dominant position in photographic film and produced a number of technological innovations through heavy investment in research and development at Kodak Research Laboratories. Kodak produced some of the most popular camera models of the 20th century, including the Brownie and Instamatic. I got one of the Instamatic cameras cameras right here. The Instamatic 100 camera. It was for 126 format film. Yep. It was cartridges that you put in here with single use flash bulbs. You replace them after each flash. Yep. So nice little toy. The company's ubiquity was such that its 
Kodak moment tagline entered the common lexicon to describe a personal event that deserved to be recorded for posterity. In 1888, the Kodak camera was patented by Eastman. It was a box camera with a fixed focus lens on the front and no viewfinder. And at the top, it had a rotating key to advance the film, a pull string to set the shutter, and a button on the side to release it, exposing the celluloid film. Inside, it had a rotating bar to operate the shutter. When the user pressed the button to take a photograph, an inner rope was tightened and the exposure began. Once the photograph had been taken, the user had to rotate the upper key to change the selected frame within the celluloid tape. The $25 camera came preloaded with a film roll of 100 exposures. So $25 at that time for the camera is an equivalent to today's uh, more than $700. So you paid $700 to get a 100 exposure camera, right? And the camera could be mailed to Eastman's headquarters in Rochester with $10 for processing. So you still had to pay like an equivalent to today's $300 to get your photos processed. Of course, the camera would be returned with prints, negatives, and a new roll of film preloaded in the camera. Additional rolls were also sold for $2 to professional photographers who wished to develop their own photographs. By unburdening the photographer from the complicated and expensive process of film development, photography became more accessible than ever before. The camera was an immediate success with the public and launched a fad of amateur photography. Eastman's advertising slogan, you press the button, we do the rest, soon entered the public lexicon and was referenced by Chauncey Depew in a speech and Gilbert and Sullivan in their opera Utopia Limited. In the 1890s and early 1900s, Kodak grew rapidly and outmaneuvered competitors through a combination of innovation, acquisitions, and exclusive contracts. Eason recognized that film would return more profit than the cameras that used them and focused on control of the film market. This razor and blades model of sales would change little for several decades. Larger facilities were soon needed in Rochester and the construction of Kodak Park began. Kodak purchased and opened several shops and factories in Europe, particularly in the United Kingdom. The British holdings were initially organized under the Eastman Photographic Materials Company beginning in 1898, they were placed under the holding company Kodak Limited. An Australian subsidiary, Australia Kodak Limited, was established in 1908. The Brownie camera, marketed to children, was first released in 1900 and further expanded the amateur photography market. One of the largest markets for film became the emerging motion picture industry when Thomas Edison and other film producers formed the Motion Picture Patents Company in 1908. Eastman negotiated for Kodak to be the sole supplier of film for the industry. In 1912, Kodak established the Kodak Research Laboratories at Building 3 in Kodak Park, research primarily focused on film and emulsions for color photography and radiography. Kodak became closely tied to Rochester, where most of its employees resided, and was at the vanguard of welfare capitalism during the 1910s and 1920s. Eastman implemented a number of worker benefit programs, including a welfare fund to provide workmen's compensation in 1910, and a profit-sharing program for all employees in 1912. In 1914, Kodak built its current headquarters on State Street. In 1915, Kodak began selling Kodachrome, not to mistake with the most popular Kodachrome from 1935. This one was a two-color film developed by John Capstaff at the research lab. Another two-color film, dupletized film, was marketed for photography of x-rays as it had a short exposure time and could reduce the dosage of radiation needed to take a photo. During World War I, Kodak established a photographic school in Rochester to train pilots for aerial reconnaissance. The war strained supply chains and Eastman sought out new chemical sources the company could have direct control over. At the war's end in 1920, Kodak purchased a hardwood distillation plant in Tennessee from the federal government and established Eastman, Tennessee, which later became the Eastman Chemical Company. In 1919, Eastman sold a large portion of his stock to company employees below market 
market value. The expansion of benefits continued after Eastman. Henry Strong died in 1919, after which Eastman became the company president. Eastman began to wind down his involvement in the daily management of the company in the mid-1920s and formally retired in 1925. Although he remained on the board of directors, William Stubber succeeded him as president and managed the company along with Frank Lovejoy. By 1922, the company was the second largest purchaser of silver in the United States behind the U.S. Treasury. In 1928, the company began offering life insurance, disability benefits, and retirement annuity plans for employees at the behest of company statistician Marion Folsom. Many other employers in the Rochester area took cues from Kodak and increased their own wages and benefits in order to remain competitive in the labor market. Eastman believed that offering these benefits served the interests of the company. He feared labor unions and believed that offering better compensation than that received by union workers would deter union organizing and avoid the potential cost of a company strike. Selling his stock to employees would simultaneously make it more appealing to investors who were wary to purchase shares because of its large stake and lower the price of the stock which would keep antitrust lawyers from investigating the company. Because Kodak was a capital-intensive industry with a low labor cost ratio, employee benefits contributed less to the company's expenses than they would in other industries. Employment opportunities were not extended to all Rochesterians. The company almost exclusively hired workers of an Anglo-Saxon background under Eastman and excluded Catholic immigrants, African Americans, and Jews. Approximately one-third of employees were female. A system of family hiring where children of employees would be hired to follow their parents reinforced the concept of an industrial community that Eastman sought to create. These practices were not seriously challenged until after World War II. As a consequence of this shared background and the robust company benefits, Kodak employees formed a close community that viewed unions as outsiders and no attempt to organize workers at Kodak succeeded during the 20th century. Beginning on July 18, 1930, Kodak was included in Dow Jones Industrial Average. In 1931, Kodak Pathé was established in France and Kodak AG was formed in Germany. Kodak was hard hit by the Great Depression, although Rochester was spared from its worst effects as banks were able to remain solvent. 17% of the company's employees were laid off between 1929 to 1933. Company founder George Eastman committed suicide at his home on March 14, 1932 due to his declining health. From 19 1931 to 1936, Kodak participated in the Rochester Plan, a privately funded unemployment insurance program to assist jobless and boost consumer spending. The program was created by Marion Folsom, who gained national recognition for his work and would later serve as a company director and cabinet secretary for Dwight D. Eisenhower. The program led to many statistical improvements at Kodak, but overall had an insignificant effect on the Rochester community, as few companies were willing to join the program. Research projects led to a number of new Kodak products in the 1930s. At Kodak Research Laboratories, Leopold Godowski Jr. and Leopold Manns invented a three-color film which would be commercially viable. In 1935, the product was launched as Kodachrome. This was the most popular film. At first, it was sold with the developing prices prepaid. You sent the film back to Kodak and they returned images and developed film at no extra cost. This practice was stopped into use due to violating antitrust laws by not allowing private stores to develop it. The company also produced industrial high-speed cameras and began to diversify its chemical operations by producing vitamin concentrates and plastic. In 1934, Kodak entered a partnership with Edwin Land to supply polarized lenses after briefly considering an offer to purchase Land's patents. Land would later launch the Polaroid Corporation and invented the first instant camera using emulsions supplied by Kodak. Frank Lovejoy succeeded William Stubber as company president in 1934 and Thomas Hargrave became president in 1941. In 1941, Kodak released the Kodak Ektra. It was a 
35mm coupled rangefinder camera launched by Kodak USA. Originally regarded as one of the most innovative yet quirky cameras of its type when first released, the Extra featured the ability to cover both the high point and low point of 35mm operation but suffered from a faulty shutter. The camera was phased out after 1948 but the Extra name was reused in the 1970s and later 2010s. After the American entry into World War II, Kodak seized its production of amateur film and began supplying the American war effort at the direction of the War Production Board. The company produced film, cameras, microfilm, pontoons, synthetic fibers, RDX, variable time fuses, and hand grenades for the government. Kodak's European subsidiaries continued to operate during the war. Kodak AG, the German subsidiary, was transferred to two trustees in 1941 to allow the company to continue operating in the event of war between Germany and the United States. The company produced film, fuses, triggers, detonators, and other material. Slave labor was employed at Kodak AG Stuttgart and Berlin Kopenick plants. American Kodak made grenades and everything to fight with the Germans and the German Kodak made grenades and fuses and all that to fight the Americans. So Kodak was on both sides of the war. But as a company, you got to do what you got to do to survive, right? During the German occupation of France, Kodak Pathé facilities in Severan and Vincennes were also used to support the German war effort. Kodak continued to import goods to the United States purchased from the Nazi Germany through neutral nations such as Switzerland. This practice was criticized by many American diplomats, but defended by others as more beneficial to the American war effort, Kodak received no penalties during or after the war for collaboration. After a 1943 meeting between Kenneth Meese and Leslie Groves, a team of Kodak scientists joined the Manhattan Project and enriched uranium-235 at Oak Ridge. Kodak experiments with radiation would continue after the war. Kodak reached its zenith in the post-war era. Era, as the usage of film for amateur, commercial, and government purposes all increased. In 1948, Tennessee Eastman created a working acetate film which quickly replaced nitrite film in the movie industry because it was non-flammable. In that time between 1949 until 1956, the Kodak Retina series cameras were produced. It also had the Kodachrome technology. I don't got the Retina series camera yet, one day I will, but this is the Retinette. It's basically from the Retina series cameras, but simplified, cheaper version. In 1949, a batch of X-ray film that the company processed mysteriously became fogged. Julian Webb, who had worked at Oak Ridge, proposed that the film had been exposed to radiation released by nuclear weapons tests. The source of the radiation was eventually traced to straw board packaging from Vincennes, Indiana, which had been irradiated by fallout that had traveled thousands of miles northeast from the Trinity test site. After this discovery, Kodak officials became concerned that fallout would contaminate more of their film and began monitoring atmospheric radiation levels with rainwater collection at Kodak Park. In 1951, the United States Atomic Energy Commission AEC began providing Kodak with a schedule of nuclear tests in exchange for its silence after the company threatened to sue the federal government for damage caused to film products. Kodak was later contracted to create emulsions for radiation tests of fallout from nuclear tests. Its cameras were used by NASA for manned and unmanned space exploration. In 1963, the first Instamatic cameras were sold, like we got here, the Instamatic 100. They were the company lowest cost cameras to date. Annual sales passed $1 billion in 1962 and $2 billion in 1966. Albert K. Chapman succeeded Thomas Hargrave as president in 1952 and was succeeded by William S. Vaughan in 1960. Louis K. Ellers would serve as president and CEO between 1969 and 1972. In the 1970s, Kodak published important research in dye lasers. In patented the buyer filter method of RGB arrangement on photosensors, which was a little beginning to creating digital photography. During the Cold War, Kodak participated in a number of clandestine government projects. Beginning in 1955, they were contracted by the CIA to design cameras and develop film 
for the U-2 Reconnaissance Aircraft under the Bridgehead Program. Kodak was also contracted by the National Reconnaissance Office to produce cameras for surveillance satellites such as the KH-7 Gambit and KH-9 Hexagon. Between 1963 and 1970, Kodak engineers worked on the Cancelled Manned Orbiting Laboratory program designing optical sensors for a manned reconnaissance satellite. The company later performed a study for NASA on the astronomical uses of the equipment developed for MOL, the Manned Orbiting Laboratory. Kodak doubled its number of employees worldwide between 1936 and 1966. The majority remained employed in Rochester, where it was the employer of choice for most. The company continued offering higher wages and more benefits than labor market competitors, including an annual wage dividend, a bonus for all employees which typically amounted to 15% of base salary. Employee loyalty was strong and the company experienced a turnover rate of only 13% in the 1950s, compared to 50% for American manufacturers as a whole. Journalist Kurt Gerling noted that Kodak employees behaved like a separate class from other workers in Rochester. From the cradle, infants are impressed with the fact that daddy is a Kodak man. Inferentially, this compares with our father is a 33rd degree mason. A 1989 New York Times article compared Rochester to a company town. Kodak's business model changed little from the 1930s to the 1970s, as the company's dominant position made change unnecessary and it made no mergers or acquisitions which might bring new perspectives. Research and development remained focused on products related to film production and development, which caused the company to fall behind rivals Polaroid and Xerox in the development of instant cameras and photocopiers. Kodak would begin selling its own versions of each in the mid-1970s, but neither became popular. Both product lines would be abandoned in the 1990s. Kodak employee Steven Sasson developed the first handheld digital camera in 1975. Larry Matheson, another employee, wrote a report in 1979 predicting a complete shift to digital photography would occur by 2000. He wasn't much off, was he? However, company executives were reluctant to make a strong pivot towards digital, digital technology since it would require heavy investment, make the core business of film unprofitable, and put the company into direct competition with established firms in the computer hardware industry. Under CEOs Colby Chandler and Kay Whitmore, Kodak instead attempted to diversify its chemical operation. Although these new operations were given large budgets, there was little long-term planning for assistance from outside experts and most of them resulted in large losses. Another effort to diversify failed when Kodak purchased Sterling Drug in, a, in 1988 at a cost of $5.1 billion. The drug company was overvalued and soon lost money. Research and development at Kodak Research Laboratories was directed into digital technology during the 1980s, laying the groundwork for a future digital shift. The Kodak K logo was introduced in 1971. The version seen here with the Kodak name in a more modern typeface was used from 1987 until the logo's discontinuation in 2006. A revised version was reintroduced in 2016. A Japanese competitor Fujifilm entered the US market with lower priced film and supplies in the 1980s. Fuji defeated Kodak in a bid to become the official film of the 1984 Los Angeles Olympics, which gave it a permanent foothold in the market. Fuji opened a film plant in the United States and its aggressive marketing and price cutting began taking market share from Kodak. Rising from a 10% share in the early 1990s to 17% in 1997, Fuji also made headway into the professional market with specialty transparency films such as Velvia and Provia which competed with Kodak's signature professional product Kodachrome. Kodak began to struggle financially in the late 1990s as a result of increased competition from Fujifilm, the company also struggled with the transition from film to digital photography, although Kodak had developed the first self-contained digital camera. Encouraged by shareholders, the company began cutting benefits and making large layoffs to save money. Despite the competition, Kodak's revenues and profits continued to increase during the 1990s due to the strategy changes and an overall expansion of the global market. Under CEO George 
FMC Fisher, Kodak's annual revenue peaked at $16 billion in 1996. Profits peaked at $2.5 billion in 1999. In May 1995, Kodak filed a petition with the U.S. Commerce Department under Section 301 of the Commerce Act, arguing that its poor performance in the Japanese market was a direct result of unfair practices adopted by Fuji. The complaint was lodged by the United States with the World Trade Organization. On January 30, 1998, the WTO announced a sweeping rejection of Kodak's complaints about the film market in Japan. A price war between the two companies began in 1997, eating into Kodak's profits. Kodak's financial results for 1997 showed that the company's revenues dropped from almost $16 billion in 1996 to less than $14.5 billion in 1997, a fall of more than 10%. Its net earnings went from $1.3 billion to just $5 million for the same period. Kodak's market share declined from 80% to less than 75% in the United States in a one-year drop of 5 percentage points. Fuji and Kodak recognized the upcoming threat of digital photography, and although both sought to diversify as a mitigation strategy, Fuji was more successful at diversification. Fuji stopped production of motion picture film in 2013, leaving Kodak as the last major producer. In 1993, Whitmore announced the company would restructure and was succeeded by George M. C. Fisher, a former Motorola CEO, later that year. Under Fisher, the company abandoned diversification in chemicals and focused on an incremental shift to digital technology. Tennessee Eastman was spun off as Eastman Chemical on January 1, 1994, and Sterling Drugs remained operations were sold in August 1994. Eastman Chemical later became a Fortune 500 company in its own right. A key component of the incremental strategy was Kodak's line of digital self-service kiosks installed in retail locations where consumers could upload and edit photos as a replacement for traditional photo developers. Kodak also began manufacturing digital cameras such as the Apple Quick Take for the Apple company. Film sales continued to rise during the 1990s delaying the traditional transition from occurring faster. But in 2001, film sales began to fall. Under Daniel Karp, Fisher's successor as CEO, Kodak made an aggressive move in the digital camera market with its easy share family of digital cameras. By 2005, Kodak ranked number one in the US digital camera sales, which surged 40% to $5.7 billion. The company also began selling digital medical image systems after acquiring the Israel based companies Algotech Systems and Oryx Computed Radiography. Despite the initial high growth in sales, digital cameras had low profit margins due to strong competition, and the market rapidly matured, its digital cameras soon were undercut by Asian competitors that could produce and sell cheaper products. Many digital cameras were sold at a loss as a result. Film business, where Kodak enjoyed high profit margins, also continued to fall. The combination of these two factors caused a decline in profits. In 2007, Kodak was number four in U.S. digital cameras sales with a 9.6% share and by 2010, they held 7% in seventh place behind Canon, Sony, and Nikon and others, according to research from IDC. By the late 2000s, an even smaller percentage of digital pictures were being taken on dedicated digital cameras, being gradually displaced in the late 2000s by cameras on cell phones, smartphones, and tablets. Digital camera sales peaked in 2007 and declined afterwards. Kodak began another strategy shift after Antonio Perez became CEO in 2005. While Kodak had previously done all development and manufacturing in-house, Perez shut down factories and outsourced for or eliminated manufacturing divisions. Kodak agreed to divest its digital camera manufacturing operations to Flextronics in August 2006, including assembly, production, and testing. The company exited the film camera market altogether and began to end the production of film products. In total, 13 film plants and 130 photo finishing facilities were closed, and 50,000 employees laid off between 2004 and 2007. In 2009, Kodak announced that it would cease selling Kodachrome color film, ending 74 years of production after a dramatic decline in 
sales. Kodak's finances and stock value continued to decline, and in 2009, the company negotiated a $300 million loan from KKR. A number of divisions were sold off to repay debts from previous investments, most notably the Kodak Health Group, one of the company's profitable units. Kodak used the $2.35 billion from the sale to fully repay its approximately $1.15 billion of secured term debt. Around 8,100 employees from the Kodak Health Group transferred to Onyx, which was renamed CareStream Health, in 2010. Kodak was removed from the S&P 500. In the face of growing debts and falling revenues, Kodak also turned to patent litigation to generate revenue. In 2010, it received $838 million from patent licensing that included a settlement with LG. Between 2010 and 2012, Kodak and Apple sued each other in multiple patent infringement lawsuits. Perez invested heavily in digital technologies and new services that capitalized on its technology innovation to boost profit margins. He also spent hundreds of millions of dollars to build up a high margin printer ink business to replace falling film sales, a move which was widely criticized due to the amount of competition present in the printer market, which would make expansion difficult. Kodak's ink strategy rejected the razor and blades business model used by dominant market leader Havlick Packard by selling expensive printers with cheaper ink cartridges. In 2011, these new lines of inkjet printers were said to be on the verge of turning a profit, although some analysts were skeptical as printouts had been replaced gradually by electronic copies on computers, tablets, and smartphones. Inkjet printers continued to be viewed as one of the company's anchors after it entered bankruptcy proceedings. However, in September 2012, declining sales forced Kodak to announce an exit from the consumer inkjet market. By 2011, Kodak was rapidly using up its cash reserves, stocking fears of bankruptcy. It had $957 million in cash on June 2011, down from $1.6 billion in January 2001. Later that year, Kodak reportedly explored selling off or licensing its vast portfolio of patents to stave off bankruptcy. In December 2011, two board members who had been appointed by KKR resigned. By January 2012, analysts suggested that the company could enter bankruptcy followed by an auction of its patents as it was reported to be in talks with Citigroup to provide debtor in possession financing. This was confirmed on January 19, 2012 when the company filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy protection and obtained a $950 million 18-month credit facility from Citigroup to enable it to continue operations. Under the term of its bankruptcy protection, Kodak had a deadline of February 15th 2013 to produce a reorganization. In January 2013, the court approved financing for Kodak to emerge from bankruptcy by mid-2013. During bankruptcy proceedings, Kodak sold many of its patents for approximately $525 million to a group of companies including Apple, Google, Facebook, Amazon, Microsoft, Samsung, Adobe Systems, and HTC under the names Intellectual Ventures and RPX Corporation. Kodak announced that it would end the production of several products including digital cameras, pocket video cameras, digital picture frames, and inkjet printers. As part of a settlement with the UK-based Kodak pension plan, Kodak agreed to sell its photographic film, commercial scanners, and photo kiosk operations, which were reorganized as a spin-off company, Kodak Alaris. The Image Sensor Solutions div division of Kodak was sold to True Sense Imaging Incorporated on September September 3, 2013, Kodak announced that it emerged from bankruptcy as a technology company focused on imaging for business. Its main business segments would be digital printing and enterprise and graphics, entertainment and commercial films. Kodak's decline and bankruptcy were damaging to the Rochester area. Its jobs were largely replaced with lower paying ones contributing to a high poverty rate in the city. Between 2007 and 2018, real GDP losses from Kodak cancelled out the growth in all other sectors in Rochester. Since emerging from bankruptcy, Kodak has continued to provide commercial digital printing products and services, motion picture film, and still film, the last of which is distributed through the spin-off company Kodak Alaris. The company has licensed the Kodak brand to 
several products produced by other companies such as the PixPro line of digital cameras manufactured by JK Imaging. And for example, this Kodak M38 is one of the examples of licensing its name to other companies. This, I don't know which company makes these, but they are made in China by some Chinese company. They just pay for the Kodak name. So it's a Kodak M38 camera, but it's not made by Kodak at all. It's just name licensed. So that's just an example of a camera that's a Kodak camera, but not from Kodak. So let's continue. On March 12th, 2014, Kodak announced that Jeffrey J. Clark had been named as chief executive officer and a member of its board of directors. At the end of 2016, Kodak reported its first annual profit since bankruptcy. In response to the COVID-19 pandemic in 2020, Kodak announced in late July that it would begin production of pharmaceutical materials. And this is a Kodak logo from 2006 to 2016 which is still used by Kodak Laris today. In recent years, Kodak has licensed its brand to a number of other companies. The California-based company JK Imaging has manufactured micro four-thirds cameras under the Kodak brand since 2013. The Kodak Extra, a smartphone, was designed by Bullet Group and launched in 2016. Digital tablets were announced with Arcos in 2017. In 2018, Kodak announced two failed cryptocurrency products, the cryptocurrency Kodacoin, which was developed by RYDE Holding, and the Kodak Kashmir, a Bitcoin mining computer, which was developed by Spotlight. In 2016, the Kodak spin-off company, E. Aperion, was founded with assets acquired from Kodak and an investment by Alibaba. The company's mission is to eliminate knockoffs and promote out authenticity. Despite the pivot to digital technology, film remains a major component of Kodak's business. The company continues to supply film to the motion picture industry after signing new agreements with major studios in 2015 and 2020. In 2022, Kodak announced it would hire new film technicians after film photography experienced a revival among hobbyists. Kodak currently produces several photographic film products in 35mm and 120 film formats and response to the growing demand for film by hobbyists, Kodak launched a newly formulated version of the discontinued Ektachrome 100 and 35mm film format in September 2018. The following year, the company announced the film stock in 120 and 4x5 film formats. Many modern cinema and TV productions are still being shot on Kodak film stocks, with for example Euphoria Season 2 being the most popular. The home market oriented 8mm and Super 8 formats were developed by Kodak in the 1950s and 1960s and are still sold today. Kodak also entered the professional television production videotape market briefly in the mid-1980s under the product portfolio name of Eastman Professional Videotape Products. So that, my friends, in as short as I could bring it to you, is the history of the Kodak the Eastman Kodak Film Company. So if you like this video, please remember to hit that like button to help with the YouTube algorithm and subscribe if you like film related content. So thank you for watching my friends, take care and see you in the next video.